and so on. I don't know of that. And then they go on to say, they, 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 when the teller, you see, again, I say this is a far reaching investigation. You know, the teller at the bank, the Marara Bank, they say, accepted $46 million from a customer as a, 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 a declaration, well, along with a wedding invitation and a certificate of marriage. And that is sufficient to say that this money is legit. A wedding invitation and certificate of marriage, $46.4 million. And that did not raise any eyebrows at the time. This is January when this deposit was made. Well, they said the financial investigation unit became involved. So come and say, man, listen, what what these young people? Them people look stupid. Them people look like they voted for anybody but can't show the SOPs. Everybody know for when the lotto, you got a ticket. The only people ain't showing the ticket and got the ticket and win and won the winnings of the lotto is the PNC and the AFC. How will Nigel use past the fact that his party has not been able to produce their SOPs. The winning SOPs. And they continue to suggest that this government is an installed government. How the pass in the fact? Dr. Ivan Van Sertema, a former professor of the University of Rutgers and an important son of Guyana's soil. Dr. Ivan Van Sertema is a celebrated Guyanese British historian, linguist, and anthropologist noted for his Afrocentric theory of pre-Columbian contact between Africa and the Americas. He is also renowned for his bravery and advocacy against allegations falsely made by colleagues regarding African history. He was born on January 26, 1935 in Kitty, Georgetown, Guyana. His father, Frank Obermuller, was a trade union leader. He was also Dr. Ivan Van Sertema, a former professor of the University of Rutgers and an important son of Guyana's soil. Dr. Ivan Van Sertem is a celebrated Guyanese British historian, linguist, and anthropologist noted for his Afrocentric theory of pre Columbian contact between Africa and the Americas. He is also renowned for his bravery and advocacy against allegations falsely made by colleagues regarding African history. He was born on January 26, 1935 in Kitty, Georgetown, Guyana. His father, Frank Obermuller, was a trade union leader. He was also Dr. Ivan Van Sertema, a former professor of the University of Rutgers and an important son of Guyana's soil. Dr. Ivan Van Sertema is a celebrated Guyanese British historian. She went on for the video. So, they separate. She live, She stay in this room and he stay in the next room. So everybody say, well, everything normal. And we go to the business, everybody go to the work. I, do. I live here right here. By time this afternoon, I say going out and sip a beer with me partner. I hear the shouting. When I come out, I, I see he down there with the girl right there. Welcome back to the flight. Hit that subscription button, buddy. And stay updated with everything that's trending in Guyana and the diaspora. Thanks. As silence continues over the SOCU money laundering probe into Assistant Commissioner of Police, Calvin Brutus, the Sunday Stabroke has learned that top cop Clifton Hickens submitted a statement to the investigators acknowledging that he collected an envelope with $8.50 M in cash from a businessman to offset the cost of Brutus's wedding at the Pegasus Suites Atlantic Conference Center. Hickens' statement to the investigators, seen by the Sunday Stabroke, will raise further concerns about the culture in the police force of accepting money and incentives from the business community despite the fact that this could undermine the role of law enforcers. The statement by Hicken was meant to corroborate Brutus' contention that he had collected a large amount of monetary gifts at his wedding which were later deposited at a bank and which then triggered a money laundering investigation by the Special Organized Crime Unit. Head of the Special Organized Crime Unit, Assistant Commissioner of Police Vizul Karimbach has denied a report in yesterday's Sunday Stabroke that top cop Clifton Hicken submitted a statement to the SOCU investigators acknowledging that he collected an envelope with $8.50 M in cash from a businessman to offset the cost of Brutus's wedding at the Pegasus Suites Atlantic Conference Center. SOCU would like to place on record that the ongoing investigation has no such statement from Hicken, and that no such statement about Hicken exists in the file. A release from SOCU said, Karen Bass called on media houses to be responsible when reporting on matters that are of sensitive nature. 2024, about 8 a.m., Bruta said he was contacted by Assistant Superintendent Rupert Ryan and informed about the allegation of money laundering made by the Financial Intelligence Unit. 
They made a report to Soko about money laundering. An assistant superintendent, Rupert Ryan, contacted Brutus about this. Right? An assistant superintendent. Can we understand this? We'll be saying it. The assistant superintendent. The first thing I want to ask, I don't know this person. What is his record? What is his track record of conducting investigations of this nature? I don't know. Uh, I don't know. So perhaps they would want to clarify and clear. You see, these are some of the questions that the media should ask. Rupert Ryan is the investigator. All right, that's what I said. What it is was his background to give us some um, semblance of um, of um, quiet truthness to say that this man is competent and capable of conducting this investigation. An assistant superintendent. And one of the things I want to ask, police here, what kind of statement Brutus gave? If you told him about this matter on the 10th and the 14th of May at 8 a.m., he said he was contacted by superintendent uh, Rupert Ryan. And in from, how was he contacted? Was it by a telephone call? Did Rupert Ryan go to him or was he summoned to the office? Was he cautioned? Is this statement that they refer to a caution statement? You see, all these are things that will bear on the credibility of this investigation. Because if the Financial Intelligence Unit, according to what you wrote, right, informed him about an allegation of money laundering made by the Financial Intelligence Unit, police will tell you that this required that this man should have been called in. And if he failed to respond to the call, he should have been arrested. Because, well, of course, you would have made your record about the report made about money laundering. Serious, serious report. Money laundering. He should have been arrested. He should have been cautioned. And told that, he do, he, he, that he's not obliged to make any statement unless he wished to do so. So this statement, we say he gave, some statement he gave here, we don't know if it's a caution statement or if it's an ordinary witness statement. Right? So that is something to, to query. And then you have here, he said he performed extra duty among the other sources of extra duty. What type of extra duty would an assistant commissioner of police be performing? You got to tell us that. You got to tell us what type of extra duty. Don't come and tell me that you perform extra duty. Where you perform this extra duty? When you perform this extra duty? What is the duration of the extra duty? The police regulation requires all extra duty um, funds and it's a junior ranks. They perform extra duty. It's supposed to be paid into the police finance office, the welfare um, fund of the police office, finance office to be accounted for and then paid back um, to the ranks. They're not supposed to get it directly. So where did he perform this extra duty? All of these are questions. I don't know if they ask those questions. And they say, how much incentive and awards did he receive the man say he received incentive and awards. And it is left at that. You got to tell me how much million dollars you receive as incentive. How much hundred thousand dollars you receive as award. And these monies are paid through the police finance office. So there's going to be a paper trail. There's going to be a record where you can do an audit to determine how much money you get through these sources. Then you got to ask here to um, stipend. How much money you receive a stipend? The master you get stipend. You get all of these things are there. And say, let them wriggle. The more they talk, it sucks in. Every time they open their mouth, they're sinking themselves low. That is providing a proper investigation is done, and that is why we continue to say, and I will say again, Soku is incapable of committing uh, of conducting a credible investigation in this matter. Soku can't make it. Soku cannot conduct a proper investigation. This thing is too far reaching. So finance, master, you get extra duty allowance, you get awards. You get, finance gotta know. You gotta get vouchers, you gotta get all everything we signed for this money is there. Have they gone to collect those um th those documents to see if, whether it or not it is so? And they, they, they go on to say, um, and I get here from whom did he receive the gifts? Who get you can't just so you get gift. You must know. Nobody, you can't come and tell me you don't know if I'm arguing. But the amount of money we're talking about here, you got to know who gave you the money. Is that a man pass and push a little hundred dollar your way? This got to be for the comp to that amount. You got to be hundreds of thousands, perhaps even million at any one pop. And you got to know. You have to know who um 
you got to tell the investigator who are the people who gave you this money. And one of the um, one of the things I I, I um, find very very troubling here is this part where he say, and the quote: "I told Assistant Superintendent Rupert Ryan that the persons, relatives, and friends would be willing to assist him in the investigation." by giving statement to support my declaration provided upon making the deposits at the Demerara Bank. And here, what are you going to go on to say? Here, what it is alleged that he went on to say, I then, I meaning Brutus, I then contacted relatives and friends that presented me with financial gifts from my wedding and Christmas 2023 and asked them to give statements to investigators at a special organized crime unit. He contacted, that is how he does do investigation? What should happen is that when you when you interrogating him, not questioning, when you interrogating him, that providing he did not um, say that he, he, he after being cautioned, he did he said that he uh, he said to maintain silence. If you're gonna interview him, you can ask either who are the people who gave you this gift, these relatives and friends. You take down the name, you can take down the contact information, and you, the investigator, have to contact these people. Not the person who is being investigated, contacting them and asking them to provide statement on his behalf. What type of nonsense is that? Is that how, again, I say Soku is not capable of conducting this investigation properly. All of these things are now being revealed. Then it goes on. Uh, then it goes on. For, uh, I am saying this too now. This is me. From my experience, gifts in the form of alcoholic beverages. I was a commander. I operated it out of um, operations at police headquarters. Christmas time, yeah, you get gifts. Some bit, people send a little uh, Johnny Walker, a little scotch, uh, a little vodka, and so on. That's the type of gift I know about. That's the type of cookies and this type of thing people will send to you. In the force, the culture that I know, that for senior persons at your board there, the ranks will pass the outer rank and make a little thing, give you some type of gift, maybe a little piece of jewelry, or some other um, gift for your um, board day. When you retire, they also give you retirement gift and the force presents you and your wife with a retirement gift. That is the culture that I know of. But me, I know this culture where 46 something million dollars um, is being given as gift as Christmas time and, and so on. I don't know of that. And then to go on to say, they, 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 when the teller, you see, again, I say this is a far-reaching investigation. You know? The teller at the bank, the Marara Bank, they say, accepted $46 million from a customer as a, 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 a declaration, well, along with a wedding invitation and a certificate of marriage. And that is sufficient to say that this money is legit. A wedding invitation and a certificate of marriage, $46.4 million. And that did not raise any eyebrows at the time. This is January when this deposit was made. Well, they said the financial investigation unit became involved. So we don't know if because of this deposit that triggered the, the involvement of the financial investigation unit. So to be fair to them, it might very well have done so. Right? Then then, then it goes on to say, um, as I said, um, why a person who is being investigated with money laundering have to make contact with relatives or friends? I said that again already. He did not have to, the man said he did not have to expend personal finances on rent, utilities. As far as I know, back in my day, things changed. Because in my day, if you live in a police house, he might live in, if you live in a, you know, they got different type of quarters. I understand now they got the senior officer's quarters where light free, I could understand telephone free and everything free. Does he live there with his family? I don't know. The man said getting meals. So they're providing meals to his family as well. So you get younger for spending salary. You, they're providing, I know that meals thing, Larry Lewis introduced it. Larry Lewis introduced for officers to get a free lunch. That's a free UN pain, but the, the state will provide you with a free lunch. And then it started in tongue, and then it was expand, it expanded to divisions as well. And then it started to filter down to the other ranks. I don't know if the junior ranks getting a free meal or if they got to pay. Perhaps the, 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 the police can tell us because the, the, the Brutus is claiming, and I know even back in my day, officers, not senior officers, officers, you go to the officer's mess at lunchtime, you got a meal. 
you get a lean. The only time you gonna get breakfast and dinner, you get a lunch rather. The only time you get breakfast and dinner is if the force is in line. If you're on standby. Other than that, breakfast and dinner you're on your own. You have to find your own breakfast and dinner. I don't know what is going on now. I don't know. But I know that when I lived in police quarters for the many years that I did, yes, you don't have to pay rent, but I have to pay me like bill. I have to pay the telephone bill for my, my, my house. I know later on when I became um, commander and, and so on, you are provided with a telephone, uh, a cellular phone, when cell cellular phone became popular, you're given a telephone and the government pays for that, the police force uh, pays for that. I know that, but to say that you don't have, I have to spend my salary, you can't, even if those things are provided, what happened to your family? You have to buy clothes, you got a child, I think, you have to buy pampers, so all of these things are being provided to you. Again, if this investigation is done, all of these things are going to be revealed. But I say you're made in security. Now, if you live in this quarters, you say you live in police quarters, how come you're entitled to made in security? How come investigators are not going to find out all of that? How come you are entitled to made in security? Let me, see, see, take over. I got a very important call coming through. I got the answer. So take over. One, a question has arisen in the public domain which I feel compelled to address. It is whether Mr. Clifton Haken, Acting Commissioner of Police, who is over 55 years old, is eligible to be appointed to the Office of Commissioner of Police. Some commentators contend that he cannot. Two, it will be recalled that a legal challenge was brought at the behest of Mr. Aubrey Norton, leader of the opposition against the appointment of Mr. Haken to act in that position. The allegation was that His Excellency President Dr. Mohammed Irfan Ali did not comply with the Constitution of Diana in making that appointment. Three, in a detailed and reasoned judgment, the learned Chief Justice dismissed that challenge and unequivocally affirmed that the President acted lawfully and properly in appointing Mr. Haken to act in the Office of Commissioner of Police. Five, Parliament has so prescribed in the Constitution Act, Cap. 2712. Section 2 of this Act provides that the retirement age of the Commissioner of Police is 55 years. It undoubtedly, since his appointment to act in the office of Commissioner of Police, Mr. Haken has been and is the officer in charge of superintending and commanding the Guyana Police Force. This indubitable state of affairs aligns with the constitutional definition of Commissioner of Police, the officer, however style, commanding the police force. 9. Article 211 of the Constitution states, Ten, having regard to the relevant provisions of the Constitution and the Constitution Act and the relevant factual configuration under review, wherein lies the prohibition against the President appointing Mr. Haken to the post of Commissioner of Police, I conceive none. Eleven, to the contrary, the conjoined effect of the relevant provisions of the Constitution and the Constitution Act impelled to the imminent potentiality of Mr. Hicken being appointed to that office. The contention, therefore, that he cannot, is an affront to both common sense and law. As over 3,000 young people attend youth conference in Reg 6, more than 3,000 young people were told of the prospects for elevation within the People's Progressive Party and its youth conference on San In Region 6. A section of the gathering at the People's Progressive Party's youth conference in Region 6, held at the Tain campus in Burbis, this conference is the latest in a series of similar events held as part of the party's countrywide drive to recruit a new generation of young members to its youth arm, the Progressive Youth Organization. PPP's General Secretary and Vice President, 
Dr. Bharat Jandio delivered the feature address to the massive gathering at team. Dr. Jandio outlined the history of the PPP and the PYO, highlighting their founding by the early leadership of the party. He shared the instrumental role played by the PYO and its members in key aspects of the PPP's political activism over the years, particularly in the struggle against the PNC dictatorship and the fight for democracy during the 1970s and 1980s, which culminated in the restoration of democracy in 1990. The General Secretary also noted that the PYO has historically served as the party's leadership incubator, providing a path through which many of the party's current leaders entered political life. He cited examples such as President Irfan Ali and himself, both of whom began their political careers in the PYO and have since gone on to hold the highest offices in the country. Dr. Jadio further emphasized to the young audience the importance of discipline and commitment to the ideals and objectives of the party, which have been key to the sustained strength of both the PYO and the PPP over the years. He further elaborated on the government's plans to transform Region 6, including the aggressive expansion of infrastructure essential for productive activities and quality of life, such as the construction of new Hope Lake canals, a four-lane highway, community roads, and the creation of opportunities for personal advancement through training programs at the Diana Technical Training College in Port Marant. Following the General Secretary's address, an interactive session was held, allowing participants to pose questions to Dr. Jagdio. The youths later engaged in breakout sessions to discuss issues they felt needed priority attention from the party and the government. This youth conference in Region 6 follows several others held in various regions, with more scheduled as the party intensifies its recruitment of the next generation of members nationwide. Only last month, Jagdio told reporters at a press conference at the PPP's Freedom House headquarters that the party is making significant strides in engaging the youth of Diana. In fact, over 6,000 young people had participated in the party's youth camps and conferences to date with similar engagements slated for Regions 3, 7 and 8. Jagdio had emphasized the critical role that young people play in shaping the future of the nation and the party. He elaborated on the PPP's commitment to developing the next generation of leaders, stressing that these camps serve as an incubator for leadership. Young participants are not only learning about political processes but are also being prepared for future leadership roles within the party and on a national level. For us, the rebuilding of our youth movement is crucial for continuity, growth, and placing it in secure hands, Dr. Jad Dio had remarked. He further highlighted the importance of fostering empathy and social consciousness among young leaders, ensuring that their governance reflects the concerns of the people. They get a grounding, they learn empathy, they learn about struggles. It's not just about personal development. It's also about developing social consciousness and empathy with struggling people. If you can empathize with struggling people, you will become good leaders and people's concerns will always be reflected in governance and policy making, Dr. Jack Dio had stated. The PPP General Secretary further expressed satisfaction with the enthusiasm of the youth, hoping that other political parties would take note of this trend. Zero. Full House. One, two, three, four, five, six. Zero. One, two, three. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seven, eight, 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 so this is this is one, two, three, four, five, six rows here, and um, this is about three hundred. So you got you got roughly a, just under just over thousand people here, right? Let me look at it. Everybody having a C, and I'm seeing a lot of young. You ever see the opposition operation? You ever see the opposition operation when they got people? Look at these people's faces. 
You ever see the opposition when they got people? Eh? Dinosaurs. They don't pick the interests of the young people. You got Amerindian, Indian. How can they mix up people they hate? They no longer pick the interests of young people. How can they pick the interests of young people? They no longer pick the interests of young people. They have lost. They have lost their way. You think Nigel Hughes could pull this kind of? Everybody have an opportunity and a say no. When will the opposition get back? To being listened to on this level, this scope. When? Can you tell me when? If they could help us to understand when they could get back to a place that they're worthy of the people's listening ear? Can they tell us? Young people, what the faces? Then people are given an opportunity to speak, to air their concerns. What the faces? And this is people who, this is the Region 6 Youth Conference. This is people who ready not only to support the country and vote, but ready to be a part of the PPP. The PPP is sweeping through, buddy. Where is the opposition? And when will they be worthy of anything? When are they gonna come and say, man, listen, what what these young people? Them people look stupid. Them people look like they voted for anybody but can't show the SOPs. Everybody know for when the lotto, you gotta got ticket. The only people ain't showing the ticket and got the ticket and win and won the winnings of the lotto is the PNC and the AFC. How will Nigel Hughes pass the fact? That his party has not been able to produce their SOPs. The winning SOPs. And they continue to suggest that this government is an installed government. How they pass in the fact. Yeah, just help me if I understand. Me and you know, I, 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 me stupid, me not too smart. Everybody is there. Some of these young people, little old. <laughs> Some of these young people, little old. But if they say they're young and they feel they're young, well, young you are. Yes, sir. Some of these young people were joining the BBB. They're in the 30s and 40s. In this picture, at least. Right? But if you say you're young, who is me? If you say a young, who is me? Watch, they had to make a tent outside for put more people. What do I say? Inside, they do? They got put outside. Me, Tata, inside alone. And everybody getting a chance to speak. You got to look at the young people and you realize their interests are peaked. You understand?
Hello? Hello? Something just sure you get an incoming call. What the young people? How how the opposition gonna replicate this? Please tell me how they gonna replicate this. I'm glad for see. How they gonna replicate this? How is the opposition gonna replicate this? Young people from all walks of life need support. What them numbers there, boy? Y'all help me out in understanding. How and when, in which day or age, will the opposition be able to replicate this? This youth, watch, watch. What is youthy? <laughs> Here. Some people say hey, we miss a way, we miss a go go back. This my guy I'm back in time. 17 year old <laughs> child in the PvP now. <laughs> 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 you can't me one miss him. Cause you could only get in if you're young. PvP never time with them old people. We cannot risk the credibility of this country, President Ali, says Constitutional Reform Commission reviewing fundamental legislation. To improve citizen rights, democracy and governance, a commission for constitutional reform is currently examining several of Diana's fundamental documents, President Dr. Irfan Ali has said. During his speech to the National Assembly last week, the head of state emphasized how new laws and reforms, like those that improve road safety, cyberspace, firearms, and violent offenses, have strengthened the government's hold on national security and the legal system. He noted too that significant changes to electoral laws have been implemented to protect the integrity of elections and the laws will now hold everyone accountable for their action in electoral processes. We cannot afford another 2020. We cannot risk once again the credibility of this country. We cannot risk again the integrity of this country by a few who would like to see our credibility and integrity damaged at their own selfish desires. Already a commission for constitutional reform is continuing works to improve core legislations aimed at improving the lives of all Guyanese. In April of this year, 17 members of the Constitutional Reform Commission were sworn in. This paved the way for enhanced democratic governance and more efforts to address evolving societal needs in Diana. The commission's mandate, as outlined by President Ali, encompassed a wide array of areas critical for potential reforms, reflecting the dynamic nature of Guyanese society and the global landscape. At the April swearing-in ceremony, President Ali underscored the pivotal role of a nation's constitution as its foundational law. A constitution must remain a living document and not become archaic. It must possess the capacity for adaptation to be relevant and to effectively address new challenges, societal changes, and emerging issues while still upholding its core principles and protecting the rights of citizens. The President said, the Constitution Reform Commission Act 2022, passed by the National Assembly, delineates key areas for potential reforms, including fundamental rights, indigenous people's rights, electoral reforms, and bolstering integrity in public office. President Ali stressed the importance of these reforms in fostering greater political and social inclusion, stating, Your ability to work together and achieve consensus will not only advance the cause of constitutional reform, but also serve as an encouragement for greater political and social inclusion. The Commission, constituted with wide representation from various sectors including the ruling party, parliamentary opposition, legal profession, labor movement, indigenous community, private sector, women, youth, religious community, and farmers, reflects Guyana's commitment to inclusivity and democratic participation. The appointment of the Constitutional Reform Commission comes at a critical juncture for Guyana, where the need for responsive government 
governance and inclusive decision-making has never been greater. President Ali's leadership in initiating this reform process reflects a commitment to advancing democracy, strengthening institutions, and ensuring the Constitution remains relevant in the face of evolving societal challenges. Several commissions have been appointed under his leadership including the Public Service Commission, the Police Service Commission, the Integrity Commission and the Judicial Service Commission, among others. These commissions play crucial roles in various aspects of governance, such as making appointments, exercising disciplinary control, and ensuring compliance with human rights and anti-discrimination legislation. Former Minister of Finance, Winston Jordan said it would be better to give each Guyanese living in Guyana a $100,000 cash grant, as he pulled tolls in President Irfan Ali's announcement that his administration will be giving every Guyanese household a one-off cash grant of $200,000. Jordan's proposal targets adult Guyanese living in the country, and according to him, it would resolve a number of challenges confronting the government, including the big question of what constitutes a household. To avoid this problem that is inherent in this issue about households, they should step back and say, listen, we are going to be giving $100,000 to Guyanese residents, adult Guyanese residents. That is easier because first of all, here is the advantages of doing that. One, you don't have the problem anymore of defining household because a lot of people think a house is a household, but that is not true. A house is not a household, Jordan said. The former finance minister, who served under the David Granger administration, was at the time was speaking on Nation Watch, a televised opposition program which aired on Sunday. Adult Guyanese, he said, could be easily identified using the Guyana Elections Commission Register of Registrant Database and supplemented with data from the Guyana Revenue Authority and the National Insurance Fee. President Ali, in making the announcement last Thursday, said Guyanese households would benefit from the one-off cash grant of $200,000 and according to the country's Vice President Barrett Jagdeo, based on the last census, Guyana has a total of 264,000 households. But Jordan was keen on pointing out that the census captures all households, including households with foreign nationals, and as such, the targeted households would be far less than 264,000. Dr. Ivan Van Sertema, a former professor of the University of Rutgers and an important son of Guyana's soil. Dr. Ivan Van Sertema is a celebrated Guyanese British historian, linguist, and anthropologist noted for his Afrocentric theory of pre Columbian contact between Africa and the Americas. He is also renowned for his bravery and advocacy against allegations falsely made by colleagues regarding African history. He was born on January 26, 1935 in Kitty, Georgetown, Guyana. His father, Frank Obermuller, was a trade union leader. He was also a People's Progressive Party parliamentarian. Frank Obermuller Van Sertema, who was elected to the House of Assembly after being successful at the polls at the 1953 general elections. People's Progressive Party headed by Chetty Jagan won the 1953 general elections but suffered the loss of a candidate through an election petition. Ivan was one of the most brilliant scholars and historians to hail from Guyana. He belonged on the same podium as the late Guyanese scholar and union organizer Dr. Walter Rodney and American giants such as Dr. John Henry Clark and Martin Bertel. Van Sertum initially focused on writing poetry after completing his primary and secondary education. He was educated at the School of Oriental and African Studies at the London University and the Rutgers Graduate School and holds degrees in African Studies and Anthropology. During his studies he became fluent in Swahili and Hungarian dialects. From 1957 to 1959, he served as a press and broadcasting officer in the Guyana Information Services. During the decade of the 1960s, he broadcast weekly from Britain to Africa and the Caribbean. Van Sertema moved to the United States in 1970, where he entered Rutgers University in New Brunswick, New Jersey for graduate work. Van Sertema began his more than 30-year teaching career at Rutgers as an instructor in 1972 and completed his master's degree in 1977. He was Associate Professor of African Studies in the Department of Africana Studies. His most famous work They Came Before Columbus was published by Random House in 1977 and showed African influences in Central and South America before the arrival of Europeans. That work is presently in its 29th printing. It was published in French in 1981 and in the same year was awarded the Clarence L. Holt Prize, a prize awarded every two years for a work of excellence in literature and the humanities relating to the cultural heritage of Africa and the African diaspora. 
Columbus Day is a national holiday in many countries of the Americas and elsewhere, and a federal holiday in the United States, which officially celebrates the anniversary of Christopher Columbus's arrival in the Americas. They came before Columbus. The African Presence in Ancient America is a book by Ivan Van Sertima that argues that Africans were in the New World centuries before Christopher Columbus arrived in 1492. The book is based on a variety of evidence, including similarities between cultures. Van Sertum appoints the cultural similarities between Native Americans and Africans, such as the Olmec heads of central Mexico and the similarities between the Aztec and Egyptian calendars and pyramids. Transportation of Goods Van Sertum documents the transportation of plants, animals, and textiles between the continents. Explorers' Accounts Van Sertum uses diaries, journals, and oral accounts of explorers to support his claim. Possible Route from Guinea Van Sertum suggests that Columbus may have known about a route to the Americas from his time as a trader in Guinea. The book has been described as fascinating and well-written and clear. However, the topic is controversial because some people believe that Africans taught Native Americans superior cultures, such as agriculture and pyramid building. I appeared before Congress on July the 7th, 1987. I'd been summoned there to give due cause why I should not they should not refer to Columbus's accidental stumble into the Caribbean, which he thought was the backside of India, as a discovery. I remember when I entered the chamber, this gentleman, head of the Queen's Centenary Commission, came up to me and said, you don't mean to say you come here to say Columbus did not discover America? I said, yes. He said, you must be mad. I said, you look mad to me too. <laughs> as a result of my presentation, Congress decided to delete the word discovery from official documents. I presented a vast, vast body of evidence, um, and it, it started as a peculiar accident because um, I was in the British Information, I was in services, then I was in the British Information Services, and never intended to come to America. I'd heard such dark things about America. I'd heard dark things about most countries. Anyway, I was on my way back. Uh, my Prime Minister had invited me to read poetry at the occasion of our, the independence of our country, independence celebrations, because I was known then as a poet. And I was on my way back, and Jan Kuru, a famous Guyanese author invited me to come to America, and I said, no, 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 I'll never go to America. I've heard such dark things about America. No, no, no. He said, don't be foolish. There are dark things about all places in the world. You come and check it out. So I came there on a Saturday. Sunday morning, he was asleep, and I came down into his library, and I saw three green books, Africa and the Discovery of America, by Leo Wiener. This was done, I think, in the 1920s. The problem with Leo Wiener, however, he was strictly a linguist. And I felt that finding a number of African words in America would not be enough to prove the point. To prove something like that, which would up overturn a great amount of thinking, would call for a vast body of evidence in many fields. So I... I actually began a critique of this 30 years ago I actually began to attack my own subject I didn't know it would become my subject because it wasn't good enough linguistics I, I was trained as a linguist and I knew that you could occasionally get a number of words you'd have to prove a lot of things you'd have to have evidence in many fields to prove something like this so I sent it to the editor and I said if anyone could show me just a few sculptures or portraits of Africans in America before Columbus, I would take another hard look at this matter because he presented no pictorial proof and he knew nothing about skeletal material so he couldn't provide skeletal proof. And the editor at Random House, Charles Harris, called me up and said, Van Sertima, something strange has happened on my table. You ended your piece by saying, if anyone could show me images of Africans in America before Columbus, I would take another hard look at this matter. And I turned the page, and I turned the page, and I turned the page. There were seven images of Africans. 
John Williams, the novelist, author The Man Who Cried I Am, had been to Mexico and met a strange German, last of the Royal House of Germany. Hitler had put him in charge of the German embassy in D.C. And something happened and he was dismissed. I was later to find out why he was dismissed by Hitler because Hitler sent the wrong a circular saying that everyone in the diplomatic service has to sign a statement saying they're a pure Aryan. And von Wutenow wrote back, now he was a conk, the last of the royal house in Germany. This was strange for von Wutenow, strange for anybody in that position. Wrote back to say, there is no such thing as a pure Aryan. All people have black blood. Oh God, he had to flee after that. Because <laughs> Hitler would have gotten him. So I rushed off to Mexico to meet this strange man. And I went to his chateau. And he'd heard about me because I had written him first and told him what I had done. And we sat in that place, okay? We sat on his steps half the night arguing because he couldn't, you have to show me a hell of a lot of evidence to convince me of something that everybody believes is, is true history. And he says, I said, I have to see these heads. He said, I have a few in my study. I said, that's not good enough. I have to be sure that they are valid, that you are now making this up. He was a little annoyed by that. He wanted to throw me out of the house. But nonetheless, I persisted. You have to prove this to me. I need to see sculptures of these people. He says, they're not in the big museums. They don't take chances like that in the big museums. You have to go to private collections. And the next day he started to take me to private collections and I was utterly stunned. You would be surprised how much history is hidden in private museums. They don't allow these things in the big places. It's just like in, in Egypt. I am responsible for returning to the modern Egyptians the splinters of the Sphinx's nose and chin which Napoleon's army blew off. A friend of mine, Garland Roberts, an adventurer, he was in England, he went into the British Museum and he found that they had the splinters of the Sphinx's nose and chin. How he did that, but he's a, he's a fellow, he's, da he's a daredevil. He would risk his life just to prove a point. And I says, you go back there. I'm going to pay your way to Britain. You go back and photograph the damn thing. Pretend you are, a, you know, messenger boy, whatever it is, get a job there, get the damn thing. And he brought back startling pictures. And I called Sheikh Anta Diop, the head of the radiocarbon laboratory in Dakar, he's dead now. He was the leading African scientist. And I got in touch with him and I told him what had happened. And I got in touch with Gamal Abdel Mokhtar, the, the, the Arab delegate at UNESCO. Sheikh Anta was at UNESCO too. And I got in touch with, I told Carla Roberts, you know, he has to be on the phone. And, I, and we started a conversation with the British Museum. And I started out by saying, sir, we understand and we have hard visual proof that you have the splinters of the Sphinx's nose and chin in your museum. And I have the Arab delegate at UNESCO here and the African delegate, etc. And we'd like to negotiate the return of the splinters of Sphinx's nose and chin to the Egyptians. Now, okay, okay. No, now, Van Sertima, we can't do that. <laughs> See, most of the things we have in our museums come from all over the world. If we started returning things to this and that country, we'd have no museums. <laughs> I said, sir, we're not asking you to destroy the museum. This is a specific object. This is a matter of the very gravest importance. I have on the line with me Gamal Abdul Mokhtar, the Arab delegate, Sheikh Anta Diop, the African delegate, myself, Carlin Roberts, who has proof that they were the pieces, as me, he photographed them. And he said, well, we will consider it. Do you know? Sheikh Anta spoke, I had a French translator, Sheikh Anta spoke, I spoke, Carlin Roberts spoke. Do you know the Arab delegate, we're returning it to the bloody Arabs, you know. He never said a bloody word because the Arabs are not Egyptian. 
Don't make any mistake about that. It's just like we're in this room here. This is America. It would be hard to find a Native American in this room. The world has changed dramatically. There have been half a dozen invasions of Egypt, the Persians, the Greeks, the Syrians, the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, the Arabs. That is not Egypt. Egypt is no longer Egyptian. They have not a damn thing to do with the building of the pyramids. We now have hard proof, very hard proof, that Egypt was African when the pyramids were built. There is no question about it. This is not guesswork. This is not theory. We found the skeletons in the ancient graves. We found sculptures, which you'll never see when you go to Egypt. They don't put those things on display. But now we have the hard proof. And I'll deal with that later when we come to deal with the Egyptian section of this lecture. But I appeared before the Congressional Committee and I presented 12 witnesses, all European. Because they're going to say I'm Afrocentric if I show them Af this African said this. No, no, no. I'm going to take the very people that you think you will listen to. Columbus is the first person. I said, that's how I began. I, I'm not the first person to suggest there were Africans in America before Columbus. Christopher Columbus is the first person to say that. He actually says in the Journal of the Second Voyage that when he was in Haiti, Native Americans came to them and told them that black-skinned people had come from the South and Southeast trading in gold-tipped metal spears. Columbus may or may not have believed, but he actually collected samples of these spears. They were sent back to Spain. They were meticulously, microscopically examined in Spain. And they were found to be identical, not just similar, identical with spears being forged in African Guinea. Of 32 parts, 18 were of gold, 6 of silver, and 8 of copper. Not only were they identical metallurgically, the words the Africans were using for these spears were the words the Americans were using. African word for gold, Ghana. That's why it's called Ghana. Gold Empire, the Golden Empire. And I checked it out in several African languages. Sarakole, Saninke, Gadzago, Kane, Vayan Mende, Kani. Kisi, it's Kani. Kono, it's Kani. Fuel, it's Kane. That's the word for gold. And that's the word Americans are using. And they have their own bloody gold word. Why are they using this strange word? And presenting material which when checked out, when the metallurgists checked it out in Europe, they found the spares were identical in the ratio of gold, silver, and copper alloys. How could you have linguistic and metallurgical identities like that? It is utterly impossible. Not only that, I then went beyond that. I not just showed Columbus. Ferdinand wrote a book about his father. And he said, my father told me that he saw Negroes north of Honduras. Columbus knew what a so-called Negro looks like. He was in Africa. That's how my book began. Columbus sitting at a table in Africa, arguing with the, the Portuguese. I tracked this man down. It is possible when you become very famous, people could track every little thing. Who you slept with, who you tried to kill, <laughs> who slept with your wife or your husband, everything. And one found a hell of a lot of stuff on this clown, or rather this villain. He did some horrible things. He's, yes, he's known as the great discoverer. Ferdinand said, my father told me he saw Negroes north of Honduras. He not only heard of them in Haiti, he actually saw them north of Honduras. Vasco Nunes de Balboa on September the 25th in the year 1513, I've got it down to the day. He's coming down the slopes of Cuaracu in Darien, which we now call Panama. And he and his men saw two tall black men among the Native Americans. They are startled. They haven't brought no black people there. Several of them commented on it. Peter Martyr said they must have been shipwrecked. Then he also said they were Ethiopians. 
Well, Ethiopian, the word Ethiopian is not used for people of Ethiopia. The reason why Ethiopia gets that name, Ethiopia means burnt skin. People of burnt skin would generally call them Ethiopian. So it's now referring to Ethiopia. Peter Marseille said there must have been shipwrecks. Lopez de Gamara said these blacks Balboa saw in the Indies were identical with the blacks we saw in Guinea. Rodrigo de Colmenares saw blacks. Captain of Balboa saw blacks east of the Gulf of San Miguel. Alphonse de Catafag reported in his book, Study of Panama. Um, no, Labe Brasso de Bourbon was the guy who went to Panama, said there were two distinct people in Panama. The Mandinga, black skin, and the Tule, red skin. The red skin would be the Native American. And Alphonse de Catafag presents us with a map showing Blacks in various places in early America, the Charus of Brazil, the Jamasi of Florida, and the Caribs of Saint, the Black Caribs of St. Vincent, pre-Columbian. Alonso Ponce cites them off Campeche in Mexico. River Palacio cites them off Tegucigalpa in the Nicaraguan Honduran border. Ramon Panea priest speaks of them as the black gold traders. Fray Gregory Garcia cites them off Cartagena, Colombia. A dozen Europeans, Christopher Columbus, Ferdinand Columbus, Vasco Nunes de Balboa, Peter Martyr, Lopez de Gamara, Rodrigo de Colmenares, Alphonse de Catafax, Labe Brasso de Bourbou, Alonso Ponce, River Palacio, Ramon Pane, Fray Gregorio Garcia, seeing things that are not there. <laughs> Probably blacks are haunting their dreams. It's absurd. You cannot have 12 eyewitnesses to event that never happened. And I have not just... 12 eyewitnesses. That is just one piece of evidence. I have 12 pieces. So it's not just the eyewitnesses, there's the metallurgical evidence. That it was tested, they were found to be identical in the ratio of gold, silver, and copper alloys as spare being forged, for, spares being forged in African Guinea. 18 parts gold, 6 silver. Full of dry shit. When, you, uh, when Mr. Gasper come, I hear he's coming over here right now. When Mr. Gasper reach over here, Y'all need to take him in that toilet. We'll get, we'll get him dry shit. And let Mr. Gasper see that no water haven't been there for the last how much months. You know, you know of that because... I attend, don't think so. He attended the meeting the 7th of this month. We had in the market and he's aware that the market is not getting water. And nothing haven't done. Man, come on. I know you're blaming it on the water treatment authority. And when the water treatment do their work. And when we as the council are supposed to be doing to ensure that the water place in the washroom for the females and the the residents but um the toilet is the priority it is toilet is priority because every day every hour somebody would like to use the toilet even the residents who come in have to come to purchase things even the vendors also would like to use the toilet because you, you heard of one of the vendors mentioned she has to go home to release herself and it's unhealthy she is paying in our, our rates and now you to use the washroom the municipal market she cannot use because what in the situation what we have solved good i want to say thank you brother thank you all right let me give my views now yeah yeah i know you're radical yeah i know i don't want to say i'm a disrespectful person but i the kind of i like to i don't go in for strawberries i'm muslim i'm a tidy banner right and let me show you something mr gaspo you see the tiny situation there if you come in no i'll tie up and put you inside there trust me if you come in now, I just I like to and tie you up and put you in the toilet. It is very disturbing to see that. Yeah, why is it that people pay? People in the market, you are stopping the town council. People in the market, you are stopping the town council. Tell you, I got the situation fixed. People in the market. Stop paying the town council! And they can't do your own nothing! The highlight is said this morning. Stop paying the town council! Until you come and do the job! Anybody in the market decide to pay the town council? You have got to the town council! Stop paying the town council! Y'all is gonna stop people bullshitting y'all! Why y'all gotta pay the town council? And then y'all get it. What is the condition with a set of dry shit? 
You were shit in the toilet one month ago. Stop peering at some cops, sir. I'm very serious this morning. And for the relevance that look in, nobody will be paying after today until you have fixed the situation in the Westmore market. Stop paying the monies to the town council until you fix it. Nobody don't pay the town council. Are that viral? The minister listening to me. Everybody listening to me. Do not pay the town council until you have your results in this market. Starting from now. Tell them you are like to set so. Do not pay the town council until you get the right thing going on. Watch it your own. Look how much women in this place. How you are using the toilet? How you are shitting? How you are you in? I would have glad to know I get my wife walking in. What kind of a gun said? I'm going to toilet. Won't get no cover. Won't get no seat. So you are considering yourself as dirty, dirty people? Most of people, you get some kind of pride. Stop paying it on council. Tell them to fix it. And they don't request it harder. Let me tell you something, viewers. I know I got thousands of people viewing me. Let me say this to y'all. This show has got to stop. Y'all do not bear this on council. Nobody's to bear this on council after no. This show has got to stop. Arrest everybody in the market. We gonna come out and we gonna march against the town council. If everybody gotta come out and march against the town council, so shall it be. Because shit got for done. I ain't come across if I waste time. I ain't know what man run this town. The only person must predict where you must go and come is God. Why we continue to sit here? And I have people concerned about the living. The, the, the Indian market, 15 years, 60 years of shame. As resident for the market, pay the town council until you get results. Tell them that you are like to set so. This show is got for done, brothers. Thank you, thank you. Do not pay. I I can see how fast they're going to come here and address the situation. Lindeners got to be Lindeners. Y'all seven people bullshitting y'all. I'm not going to live with them kind of thing. If they got PVP supporters in this market, who want to follow the PVP, let them follow, let them scold me. I don't have time with that. Why do you gotta be treating you like dogs? This is a market and a small bite. I used to come in and shop. What's in this market condition? What's here? What is market condition? You got more stands in the cup more than anything else. Why? Every day you come for standing in the market, it's some rabbit jump on a foul. This is how you want development. Do not pay the town council after today. So when I hear you are paying the town council, I can watch it all and laugh. Can you strip it? Do not pay the town council. Nobody in this market. The watching.
Why you guys go in your pocket? If you go in your pocket, we do your stand. Take it out, you don't cook the money. So we are paying for. Take it out, you don't cook some money. Yes, yes, bye. I got a man. I get too worked up sometimes. Yes, you know, I don't know nonsense, man. I can't do that. Y'all take care of yourself. Y'all don't pay the tongue kongs. I tell y'all. You gonna see how fast. I seriously, y'all don't pay the tongue kongs. You gonna see how fast. They gonna come and I can do all we all want. I share. You got some dry shit in the toilet for two months ago. Anytime I get a girlfriend, she go in the toilet. Me want she back. How much money y'all get in water and all them things now? And y'all still uncomfortable in this place? Man, y'all get real, man. Get real. Get real, buddy. Get real. Good afternoon, son. Y'all do not pay. Do not pay the town council. No rent. Until you fix it. Shopping this with people. You guys let me say this here. The only way people can respect people is when you do what you got for them. Otherwise, so that people can continue to disrespect you. Let me go ahead and suck my voice and make sure everybody here. Nobody is to pay town council after today. Y'all don't pay town council unless they do the work. Nobody is to pay mayor town council until they do the jobs. Nobody is to pay town council. Until they do their jobs. Hope my voice have been heard. No, nobody do not pay town council until they do the work. I hope my voice have been heard. Y'all don't pay town council. Police are currently investigating the murder, suicide of a Cuban couple that occurred at their home on Station Street, Kitty, on Saturday afternoon. According to a police press release, the deceased have been identified as Uni Zamora Castro, 25, and her 60-year-old reputed husband known only as El Tio. Authorities responded to the scene around 5.30 p.m. after reports of a violent altercation to find Castro lying on the ground, face up while the man was hanging from the roof of the house. The police said initial investigations revealed that Castro and El Tio were living together in the two-story concrete house, which they shared with several others. Friends and neighbors said that the couple had a tumultuous relationship. Yesterday, well, let me give you from the start. He and she come from Cuba, right? They come here about a week now, right? And he, after yesterday, she telling him, she ain't want nothing for the video. So, they separate. She, live, she stay in this room and he stay in the next room. So everybody say, well, everything normal. And we go to the business, everybody go to the walk. I, do. I live here right here. By time this afternoon, I say going out and sip a beer with me partner. I hear the shouting. When I come out, I, I see he down there with the girl right there. And he stop the girl, right? I can't get in because he locked the, 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 the steel door with a um, padlock. So I, I, you see this one here? I tell her, let me break this door and get in here. So a couple of weeks try to break in. And by the time he hear that, he, he got inside. And me know he hang himself. That's it. Me know the part. You got name and stuff with them? I don't know the name. She know the name. She's a relative? To me. Eat butterfly sea moss powder. Take your daily routine to the next level. Natural vegan superfood powder, essential multivitamin powder made just for you. Mm -mm. Yeah, my couple morning ago, critics come on the live. Oh, we found the culprit. We know who given. You know, he's called me smelly smell. We know who given smelly smell her information. 
on this government. Could you believe the traitor is one of the own just because he wants to be president and this and the and critics come on the live. Y'all know it's Nandalal, they say. Giving me poor Nandalal. Anyway, y'all kill Nandalal. Me really kill. <laughs> Hello. Yes, is he. Nandalal, tell them it's you give me the secrets. Yes, yes, is Nandalal. Y'all, please. How lying Kathy uses. She presents this veneer of sophistication and, and that she did all of this work. Zero work. She still... She still has not answered why she refused after the, the bill was passed to liberalize telecommunication in tw and they promised the liberalization of tele telecommunication in their manifesto. Why she didn't sign the order.